All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to start out. Uh, I have a, I have a few slides here. Some of them are kind of fun. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the case for markets and intellectual property, uh, which is really the argument I make. We were just talking about the fact that um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different strands going on in copyright law and theory right now. And you have a number of, of companies and people and artists who are involved in the creation of intellectual property. And they have a point of view about their ability to, to control and decide how what they do should be exploited, how it should be um, how it should be used and how they should be able to market it and how they should be able to profit from it. Um, there is another whole strand uh, that has to do, and, and, and there's a whole series of arguments that I think began to come up, uh, well actually for a very long time, but really began to bubble up, I think, probably 10 or 15 years ago, concerned about the breadth of intellectual property law, concerned about the question of um, how far should a copyright go, what should we be able to protect, what should uh, uh, you know, when should I have to go get a license from an architect whose building is in the background? How much should a trademark owner be able to continue to protect uh, their trademark in various contexts? And I'm not really going to talk too much about those issues, even though that's a lot of where this debate started. And frankly, we will talk at the end. I put up some talking points, but I'm ho happy to talk about whatever issues in this general area you want to talk about. There are a lot of very interesting issues to me and to others around the periphery of copyright. <laughs> I think people are so going to be surprised to find out that even as part of a big company uh, and as a consumer and as a guy who loves technology and loves gadgets and all the interesting things that are happening on the internet, um, I kind of agree with. I actually care a lot about fair use. I care a lot about having the breadth to create our stuff and to, to sell it uh, without having to get undue licenses, without having to get permissions. Um, we care a lot about those issues and we are probably not as much in disagreement with some of the people who uh, you know, consider themselves innovators, and we'll talk a little about what I mean by innovation. Um, what we really care about and what we're really focused on uh, in our business right now is the exact copy. The copy where there is no new creativity, there is no new innovation except maybe, you know, ways to, to, to distribute it, but no real creativity innovation added to the content itself. Um, it's about the exact copy. It's about our movie that we spent $200 million to make a market that you find for free the next day uh, on a site that's based in Hong Kong or the Ukraine or Vanuatu or some of these places. Um, that's the concern. Um, nevertheless, they come in tension with one another because protecting those, what we would consider markets uh, for IP, uh, re requires at the periphery some dealing with a bunch of balancing kinds of issues. And I think that's where the excitement is right now, and that's maybe where we're on a different position where, with some others, uh, particularly in the academy. Uh, but I think you know, our, our experience is that we really trust in negotiations to deal with these issues uh, much more than we do regulation or with the ability of people to uh, take and exploit um, content without, without paying for it. Where I start, really, is with copyright and free speech. Uh, copyright is, and free speech are both embodied in the Constitution. Actually, copyright came first. When the Constitution was adopted, there was actually a provision which granted Congress the power to grant people exclusive rights uh, in the works of their writings and discoveries. So the basis of patent and copyright law is right there in the Constitution. Uh, a couple of years later, when the, the uh, <laughs> Bill of Rights was enacted, um, uh, the very First Amendment obviously dealt with the question of free speech. Um, I don't think these two issues are in tension, really, and there's been a lot of theory uh, really over the last more than 200 years talking about copyright, which encourages people to speak, encourages people to come forward and, uh, and write and get their thoughts out and, and participate in the dialogue and, and, and have a, uh, a way to, f to uh, finance that activity. Um, originally it was newspapers and books and later all kinds of other activities. Um, that was a considered a core First Amendment value. Encouraging the freedom of the press meant providing the, free, the, the press and individuals with the opportunity to benefit from their work. Um, and that's really the point here. Copyright industries, just to give you an idea of the size of the business that we're talking about, um, in the most recent numbers, which were uh, 2008 figures, were $889 billion business. That's the media and software uh, it's games, it's, um, it's music, uh, it's all kinds of businesses that depend on copyright. We're not even talking about the patent business now, we're talking about the copyright business uh, is 6.4% of the country's gross domestic product. 
um, and they talk about industries that relate to copyright being a one and a half trillion dollar business. Um, it's something that matters a lot. These are businesses that pay taxes, they're businesses that employ a lot of people, uh, they're businesses that, um, that, that foster creativity. Um, the, uh, the, the, the notion of having the right to decide uh, whether your work, whether your activity um, in the intellectual property area uh, is entitled to protection is actually baked right into a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the document that created the United Nations. And uh, you'll see right there, um, the first is a First Amendment value. It's the ability to participate in the dialogue to receive information. Um, and the second is the right to, uh, that you have a moral fundamental right to protect uh, anything, scientific, literary, artistic productions of which you are the author. Again, right there, um, if you make it, if you write it, if you create it, if you invent it, uh, you're entitled to profit from it. Somebody shouldn't be allowed to take it from you. Copyright drives the sale of a lot of these interests. Nobody ever watched, nobody ever bought an iPod to look at it, well, maybe a few people. Uh, people buy iPods because there's interesting software that runs on it, there's music that plays on it. Uh, the Kindle is to see books, it's not about the Kindle. Um, copyright drives innovation in all these consumer product markets. Uh, people are using them because they love the stuff that they can participate in with them. Um, these, uh, it, it's an industry that actually, uh, when we talk about innovation, and we'll talk a little about some ways in which our industry and our company partic in particular participate in innovative new businesses and online businesses, but uh, when you talk about innovation, some people try to take that debate and refer to businesses that rely on, uh, on, on, um, on unlicensed IP and say, hey, you know, this is the kind of thing that's innovative and this is the kind of thing that having to license IP would prevent. And I would say that a more sustainable kind of innovation really is about the kind of innovation that you get when, if you make an investment, you get an opportunity to get a return. And so the entertainment business uh, the movie business, the ability to invest in movies and get a rate of return, develops things like uh, digital, um, digital mo motion picture screens, three dimensions, new cameras, uh, a host of all kinds of things in the movie business and the television business. Again, there have been huge amounts of innovation. Those are all funded by the view that somebody's going to engage in big coordinated activity, invest a lot of money in big labs, um, and design and invent things that they're going to get a rate of return on. They're going to get a rate of return on because they're useful in a movie business that's vibrant, in a programming business that's vibrant. Uh, again, some, just, uh, some interesting statistics about the size of the business and the importance to the economy. Um, the next slide, I think, is obvious to everybody living in this age. Uh, piracy is a problem, right? We have new networks. It's easy to move content around. It's a lot easier than it used to be. Uh, you know, when I was um, starting out copying VHS cassettes, if any remember what those are, uh, you know, you could copy a movie, it would take a day uh, or at least a few hours and, uh, and you could pass them around to your friends, it wasn't such a big problem. Now, uh, you know, things like rapid share, mega upload, other things can make a copy of a movie available to millions of people uh, more or less in an instant. Broadband connectivity uh, is, is high. Uh, it's certainly going to go higher. Uh, the speed of what constitutes broadband is growing very quickly. Um, and lots and lots of consumer devices are taking advantage of new capabilities, cheaper storage, in order to make uh, copies and uh, in order to facilitate new ways to use content. Um, so as a result, uh, there, is a, there is a huge increase in uh, the ability of people to engage in unlicensed content distribution. Um, I do like to, to, to point out that Viacom is an innovator. Uh, I didn't really talk about at the beginning about what Viacom is. Viacom's businesses are really twofold today. We've been in a bunch of different media related businesses, but right now we're in the movie business. We own Paramount Pictures, and we are in the media networks business. We own a company called MTV Networks. Uh, you all know MTV, and the MTV Networks business includes brands that you've all heard of like uh, Nickelodeon and VH1, uh, Comedy Central, uh, country Music Television, Spike, and some others. Uh, and um, it also includes a number of new businesses, which are, um, some of that is about distributing those businesses online, and some of it is about entirely new businesses. Some of you may have played the game Rock Band, uh, which is from a company that we own called Harmonix, uh, and which just recently came out with a Beatles version. And uh, it is a really cool and different and digital way to experience music. Um, 
So just, to, just some of the kinds of things. We license our content to Netflix. Netflix is a non-cable way to get content. We, uh, we license our content to Hulu, which I'm, I'm sure you've all watched, uh, a way to get television shows on your computer instead of on your television set. We license through Apple. You can get our shows through um, on PlayStation, uh, on mobile devices. We're the number one programming service on Verizon Wireless. Uh, we have a bunch of sites. We have something called Flux, which is a uh, social networking site that, that goes across a lot of our brands. Uh, so so we're, we, are, um, we are in uh, 50 countries, 25 languages. We have uh, 750 movies that are available for download, own, uh, or rental, or both uh, online. Um, we're very much taking advantage of the, the new business <coughs> opportunities that are available to us online, and very interested in the kind of ways that we can meet you know, your needs and the needs of consumers uh, by taking advantage of, of all this has to offer. At the same time, uh, as we talked about, a huge amount is available on pirated sites. Uh, different industries have done some studies. Some of those are here. The movie industry has done a calculation uh, that they lose $8 billion a year to piracy. That's uh, not just online piracy, but those are sophisticated numbers. That's not just saying, that's not just, not just adding up the number of copies that are downloaded and saying each one is worth X number of dollars. These are done with surveys in a number of countries and talking to people about uh, the offset for promotion, talking to people about how much of that's additional viewing versus substitutional viewing and trying to do the best estimates that people can. So they're, they're fairly sophisticated numbers. The other studies are done the same way. Uh, it's about $3 billion in games. It's growing very fast. Some of you have been on PSP. PSP is open to pirated copies. Uh, that has been a real problem for Sony. Uh, in music, it's a $12.5 billion problem. Uh, certainly, pirated music is a much bigger business than, than uh, licensed music at this point. Um, and there's a lot of cost shifting going on in that business. Big companies like ours end up paying a lot of money for music rights uh, because that's what's subsidizing, that's what's, that's what's supporting the music business now. So the licensing of music for television shows, the licensing of music for cable and the like is supporting music and, uh, and software. Uh, their estimate is over $5 billion lost. Um, just to give you, I, I just did a couple of slides to show you how easy it is to pirate. Um, I would be surprised if uh, all of you hadn't seen some of these or all of them. But uh, on YouTube, for example, uh, we recently just did this screenshot. You can see a movie that's a, uh, a reasonably expensive picture and recently in the stores, um, or, or I guess in this case not so recently, Bowling for Columbine. Uh, you can see even though YouTube has a 10 minute limit, uh, somebody just put up uh, the entire movie in, in 12 parts. Uh, we've seen actually full length movies in a single part available on YouTube and other user generated content sites. Um, you can see from this that uh, MarketWire is, is, uh, is, is paying money for an advertisement against uh, an unlicensed clip. Uh, as well, somebody's putting a clip down here, it looks like iTunes at the bottom of the page. Uh, and so that line license clip is generating revenue, but not any revenue for the people who produced the material. Uh, it, Chinese ad there for any of you who reads Chinese. Uh, but you can see uh, that some of the sites are, are, are difficult to find in jurisdictions where enforcement is very hard. Uh, here you see uh, an episode of South Park available on Tado. Um, and even legitimate companies are getting in on the act. Uh, Real DVD uh, came out with a product last year, it's been subsequently enjoined by a court in California, uh, but Real DVD said, you know, we'll, we'll break the encryption on a DVD and allow you to copy it to your hard drive, which is a feature I'd love. Um, and in fact, our industry now realizes that this is a feature people love and are selling DVDs. Some of you may have seen them called second session DVDs, where you buy the DVD and it has a digital un um, copy that you can copy over your hard drive. Um, of course, you can download these things to your hard drive. And our concern really wasn't around real DVD letting you copy your DVD to your hard drive. Our concern was that you could go to Netflix and pay $9 a month and copy as many DVDs as you want, essentially for free. And they were enabling that business as well. So what's happening to piracy and why are we so concerned? It's moving from P2P to streaming. Uh, many of you have experience with P2P. P2P is slow, especially with movies. It can take you a few days. Uh, there's a longer version of this presentation that shows how it works. I don't need to do that. But what you do see is that it's now moving to a streaming environment because as a consumer, 
that's a much better way to watch a movie. If you can find it on an online site where you can just stream it to your computer, uh, you can watch it right away. You don't have to wait for the thing to download. Um, it is peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer for video seems to be on the wane. The numbers are actually uh, significantly declining, but it's getting picked up very quickly uh, among, uh, among these uh, streaming sites. A uh, lot of people are starting to use video sharing sites. Now, you know, some of that's, a lot of that's legitimate. A lot of that's UGC. Not, not, not all 19% is pirated, but the pirate percentages are very high. Um, and the other thing that's very concerning and is that lots of TVs are being connected to the internet. Now, I say concerning. It's a great opportunity. TVs connected to the internet are something that we're working with. Uh, Hulu on the internet, some of the download to own services and the like are going to be great things. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for piracy to become more of a mainstream activity. I'll show you just a couple of the businesses that are built on this. Rapid Share, uh, Rapid Share has a business model <coughs> that's very interesting. Uh, you upload content to Rapid Share and make it available to your friends, and the more people who come to watch your content, the more money they'll pay you or they'll give you gifts. Uh, so they're paying for that viewership. Uh, the way they make their business model is charging both subscriptions and selling ads. Uh, and you just do the little business model. It's not a bad little business. This is not a guy in his garage. Uh, you know, it's not an end user uh, who's, who's, who's making a mistake. But we figure anywhere from 15 to $200 million, $175 million of profit a year uh, because it's very handy to be able to have a media business when you don't have to pay for the content. The sites are looking better. Uh, this looks like a real site. It, some people, um, a meaningful number of people would come across the site and not realize that it was a pirated site. Uh, you can see they're very proud of the fact that they have 10,000 movies of premium quality. Um, so it was just a, a sample. If you, if you scour around, use the search engines, you can find an awful lot. Um, why does it matter? Um, and should we be doing anything about it? As I mentioned, you know, making one movie these days and distributing a movie on average costs a little more than $100 million. Uh, some pictures cost more than $200, $250 million. And there's a market for big budget <laughs> motion pictures. Not all, not all content is going to be big motion pictures. And there's lots of new stuff that costs less, lots of new things that become available. But consumers like big budget motion pictures. They like high production value television. Um, in order to make it, you have to have an opportunity to uh, generate the revenue from it, and therefore you have to be able to transact with a, with a customer. And piracy undermines that. It keeps the communication from customers to providers from happening. It keeps things that people would like to see from uh, being things that they can see, because the money chain from users to producers uh, begins to disappear. Um, it harms the consumer experience. Uh, a lot of money is spent on trying to, and a lot of time and effort and creativity is spent on trying to create an experience when you're in the theater watching a television set that grabs you, draws you into the story, that makes you really love the characters or loves the show. Sometimes it works. Um, but when a consumer begins to experience the content of the show in a bad way, uh, that could hurt your brand. Um, we talked about the economic numbers. And beyond that, uh, you know, and I think a lot of people have seen, particularly in the music space, that when people begin to think of things as free, they don't value them in the same sort of way. They begin to think it's a free kind of thing and it's, it's not a thing that is of value and over the long run. That may be uh, the biggest issue at all. There is something you can do about it. Um, I'll give you one example. In the user-generated content space, we've been working with companies that are doing things called filtering. Uh, two or three years ago, uh, it was a little harder to do. Some of these things have existed for, um, for a long time. Uh, interesting, the technology really began to develop uh, for different reasons than content matching. Um, in the case of one of the technologies <coughs> we used, for example, uh, the intent was they were, it was an automatic way to tell if somebody's commercial was running on, uh, on a radio station or a television station, and they were using that as a way to c just report back to advertisers that they got what they paid for. Uh, some of them work better than others. Some of them are audio only. Some of them are video, and they are able to match the video file. Um, but what they do is they give you an automatic way to tell whether the content is licensed content or not licensed content. Um, and then, in some cases, they let you do some different things with them. So, for example, YouTube now has a, uh, has a filter built in. 
Um, it matches on the video file as well as the audio file, so it helps us prevent. We, we've been trying very hard to avoid the mashup, as I talked about, or things that involve new creativity. So we make sure that the, cl the clip, um, as best as we can, is really just an exact match of our content. Uh, we, we try to match both on audio and video, or else we have people look at it to make sure that, uh, that it's really not a fair use issue. And, uh, and then we can make decisions, and they just populate a table, say, okay, the, uh, this is content that needs to come down, this is content that can stay up, or a third category, this is content you can run an ad against. And, uh, and then we'll participate in the ad revenue. And so a lot of content companies are working with that model, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting model. It lets, you, uh, it lets you control your content or make a decision that you're willing to participate in this business opportunity um, and receive some, some reward. Uh, just a, an example of a recent one. Uh, so some of you may have noticed, uh, so we, when, uh, when we ran the MTV Music Video Awards in uh, September, <coughs> the, there was a clip where Kanye West came up and, and told everybody that uh, who should have won the award. And uh, immediately, Lots and lots of clips were posted to, uh, to YouTube and other places. Um, in 2008, we had 21.3 million views of the VMAs on sites that weren't our own. And, and at that time, we weren't licensing any user-generated content sites, and only 16.8 to our own. So the sites on the left were making money. They were selling ads. They were generating traffic to other parts of their sites, uh, but paying nothing for the content that we produced. Uh, this year, uh, we still had 19.2 million views that were not us, but this year we had 35.5 million that were us. Uh, the feature was, as the Video Music Awards were running, we were loading our content into filters and the sites were coming down. And frankly, the most useful piece of it was that we were training users that the clips were up. You could get them, they were embeddable, they were linkable, you could include them in your email, you could include them in your blog, but they were on our sites. And so it was an opportunity for us to participate in the benefit of what we were spending the money to produce. Um, so YouTube comes up, and people really begin to, to focus on what's a reasonable thing to ask a user-generated content site to do. And as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, we're really in both pieces of this space. We run user-generated content sites. We like uh, we like the creativity and the aspects of it. We have shows that are based on user-generated content. We like participating with our community and developing the creativity. Um, at the same time, uh, what we can't do or is to allow the user-generated content sites to benefit and profit from the content that they're not paying for. Now, that's imperfect. We can't, we can't be perfect about it, and we can't expect everybody to find every clip of material that's up on their site. And we certainly don't want to be in litigation with a lot of people over these issues. We want to come up with a way that everybody can coexist in a world that seems fair. So there was a negotiation that took place among a number of media companies and a number of user-generated content sites. And we developed something called the UGC principles. And the idea was, use the technology that's available as best as you can, and everybody's going to agree that's going to be good enough. And the world will continue to develop, and you'll continue to develop these things. These, these, uh, Principles are available. I think they may, you may have seen copies of them as part of the reading material. Um, the reason I think they're really interesting is because it shows that there are possibilities of working on a consensual solution and working your way towards practical results. Uh, what happens when people sit down in a room and they say, this is what we can do and this is what we need to do, is you can work some things out that, that, uh, that really work. Um, in other environments, we talked a little bit about mega upload and rapid share. Their real interest is not in coming up with a rational solution. Their interest is in monetizing content, um, and they're unwilling to come to the table to work on, on reasonable solutions. Uh, graduated response. This is a, you started to hear about this perhaps in France and other parts of the world. The idea is that we don't want to be suing end users. It's expensive, and it's painful, and it feels like bullying. Um, there are end users who have legitimate answers to things. There are end users who've been spoofed. There are end users who don't understand. Uh, and so the idea is to try to help educate people about what's allowed and what's not allowed and to begin to uh, impose a sanction that's more proportional to the harm. And so I think there was a feeling the record companies were big on suing end users. 
there was a feeling, you know, uh, average people with average resources were finding themselves on the other end of lawsuits with very expensive resources uh, and unlimited, very expensive lawyers and very unlimited resources, and it felt like terrorism. Uh, we need to move back, we need to move to a system that feels more in balance and fairer. And so there's a lot of discussion going on about whether we can come up with a system where the end user's name is never disclosed to a copyright owner, but ISPs pass along notices. People can't tell when people participate in peer-to-peer -peer networks who they are, what IP addresses are participating in the network, uh, not their names, but, but the IP address, uh, and begin to look for non-judicial ways to deal with that issue, uh, and as well for ways to people to challenge it. So I think part of a rational system uh, and part of the learning is there ought to be some non-court way to deal with an ombudsman or a mediator who says, well, wait a second, you know, there was a problem with my computer. It wasn't my computer. It was spoofed or something else. Uh, yes, I got four notices, but I don't get it. Um, but some ways that feel fair to people to resolve disputes and to make sure that the, the issue is not overbearing. Um, it is, a, it is a difficult thing because the very same people who are your customers and the people that you care most about making happy uh, need to be treated with respect and at the same time uh, there's really no other way to deal with the problem other than, uh, than dealing with the need to, to move viewing into licensed contexts. So I pretty much just talked about, uh, about this slide. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the criticisms about copyright. As I started out, uh, people talk about copyright pr prevents creativity and locks up knowledge, uh, that it prevents innovation, uh, that it's just for big guys and it's not for, for, for the average person. Uh, the technical protection expands the rights beyond copyright. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of these in the next few slides, and then at the end, I'm going to kick it open for people to ask questions, and uh, let's just engage in a, in a dialogue. Um, one of the most popular things in the world is to say that things ought to be free. Um, it has sold a lot of books, a lot of copyrighted books. Uh, high school elections, too. Yes, it's true. Free is a good thing. Uh, yeah, actually, even some, uh, even some national elections. <laughs> Although, you know, Chris Anderson's book was free for a month online, and then now you have to pay for it. Um, and what's interesting is actually, although it sells books, Chris Anderson's book was not about free at all. Uh, he talked about free, and it got a lot of play by people who'd read the title and maybe the, the, the leaf. When you actually read the book, what he talks about is that free is part of a business model, and that free works when it is a way to provide uh, a sample, it works as a way to get people a part of, of something, and then there may be a pay model behind it. It may be a way to tease somebody into watching an advertisement. Uh, giving things away has always been a part of a commercial enterprise. People have always allowed samples. They've always provided free stuff as a way to sell stuff along the way, get you to come to something so they can put a billboard next door to it. Uh, that's what Chris Anderson's book focuses on. It focuses on a wide variety of creative models along those lines free as a way to promote. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details about these other books. It was really just to, to highlight. Uh, We've read parts of at least two of them in this class already. Yeah. Have you? Yes. And uh, last year and some of them. Last semester and next semester we'll read a couple of them. OK. I mean, James Boyle's argument, that, that's another conversation. We could talk about that later if you want. Uh, it is true. There is absolutely no question that copyright, and this is to counter James Boyle's argument, Copyright is not necessarily, if you asked a consumer, would they rather pay or would they rather be free, every one of us says, we like free. You know, and it definitely feels like if you want to charge for something, they, people throw out the term, it's anti-consumer. And in fact, when you really get into it, it seems to me that what the consumer really wants at the end of the day is the opportunity to deal with as many possible vendors at as many possible price points and many business models as possible. But they want the product to be created in the first place and they want people to be motivated to create it to serve them and are willing to pay a fair price or watch an ad or whatever it is that ultimately generates that content. We use a, you know, there's a, a the analogy is if you said milk should be free, um, everybody would say that's a great idea. Uh, when all the farmers stopped producing milk, they'd say maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Um, and the same thing really applies uh, with respect to copyright. 
Let me talk a little bit again about the theme about how copyright and the First Amendment and how copyright and, and, and the users really play together. Um, and and these, these issues are really important in the sense of dealing with some of the criticisms. First off, the fair use right uh, or the fair use defense is a key part of copyright. The point is, is that there is a place at which the rights of an owner of copyrighted material need to be limited because now they're infringing on free speech as opposed to adding to free speech. So somebody who writes, and you've got, you guys have probably talked about this in more detail, I'm going to talk about it now, somebody who writes a review of a movie, somebody who takes a little piece of uh, something that you all know about that's copyrighted material, don't want to refer to it, but say something else, say something different, something that's not just repeating the work and using the same work and interfering with the market for it, but somebody who's doing something transformative with it and making something new and different has a right to do that, and that's a very important part of making the system work. Second, and this is really important as well, is that copyright, unlike patent, and in a lot of places like Boyle's book, among others, where they, you will see people who don't like copyright for whatever reason deliberately combine copyright and patent. <laughs> and it's a real mistake. They just say IP, it's all the same thing. Copyright does not protect ideas. It's right there at the beginning of the Copyright Act. Copyright is designed to encourage people to put their ideas out there. Um, what copyright does, it gets you to speak, it gets you to write in the newspaper. It encourages people to take those ideas and use them up in different ways. Now, it's an oversimplification because figuring out where the idea ends and the expression begins is not simple. Um, and lots of court decisions have been based on that particular issue. But if you're not taking from the expression of the idea and you're taking the concept, you're absolutely allowed to use it and that's part of what makes copyright work. We rely at Viacom on fair use every day. Uh, I am not an exponent that copyright should be huge and should go as far as it could possibly go. So we talked about my issue is about the exact copy. So we have a show, Ta Show, so we may have seen it on MTV, uh, where he spends a lot of time talking about user-generated content and what's cool and what's out there. Uh, VH1 uses clips from video uh, and creates the show called Best Week Ever. It relies very heavily on fair use. Um, there's a fun one. We litigated this issue. Uh, to me more, uh, it, this, this is probably before a lot of you guys were born. Uh, maybe not quite. But, but this cover was a very, very famous cover uh, where Demi Moore was pregnant and uh, Vanity Fair ran it on their cover. And so a few years later, we came out with this movie, Naked Gun 33 and a half with Leslie Nielsen in the same pose. Uh, and we got sued by Annie Leibovitz, who's the photographer, uh, and we won. Um, this is clearly fair use. Nobody, nobody bought that instead of the Demi Moore picture. Uh, uh, they've, they've seen some other similar works. We've, we've shown them a video clip of uh, a very funny video clip. Right? We, uh, Sesame Street. Oh, Sesame Street. The count censored where the word count is beeped out, so it sounds like he's saying, I love to beep. <laughs> clearly no parent is going to give that to their kid instead of the actual count. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a good example of fair use. It's also a good example of how, uh, how, we, how we use it. We care about this stuff. And, and the reason why you did this, of course, is because at the time everybody remembered the picture. So it was funny. And if we hadn't used the picture, if we'd come up with some other pose, it would not have made the reference. And so this is a classic example of parody, which is an example of fair use. Uh, this is a complicated slide. I'm not going to cover all of it. The point that I want to make is people make concerns about digital rights management. Now, why do they, people dislike digital rights management for a number of reasons. One of them is that the, uh, it, it, a lot of it has been really bad. So a lot of it has really affected the way you want to use things, even in a license terms. They, they, you know, your license disappears when you're supposed to have it. There's a lot of problems with early implementations of DRM. The point I wanted to make with this slide um, is that digital rights management also enables different business models. And in the movie context in particular, digital rights management is enabling us to do a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff. So for example, uh, if you go to iTunes, you can rent a movie now. It used to be you had to download it to own, but now you can rent it. So we can charge $3 and you can have it for 
I think the, the business rules now are uh, 24 hours of watching, but you can keep it on your computer for 30 days. We can charge $3 for that. Without DRM, we'd have to charge for, to own the movie, or one could say we have to charge for the right to pirate the movie. Um, it enables us to experiment with different ways that consumers might want to like the material, and a lot of those are at lower price points. And so what it does is it, it gives us the facility to experiment and innovate with different ways that people interact with the material and come up with an economic model that works for the production of the movie, but also, uh, but also may expand the audience and make it more affordable. Some of the other things that we do uh, using digital rights management, Epix is a, is a really cool new application. Epix launches at the end of October. It's a new movie service. Uh, it has first run movies. Uh, in some ways, it's just like HBO or Showtime. You can get it on your cable system. But what you can also do is you can get it on your computer. And if you get the cable subscription, the computer service is free. And this is called an authenticated model. Uh, and there's uh, a server on the other end that, that knows you're a cable subscriber and authenticates a number of devices. Uh, and you can watch your movies on your, on your computer. You could be in a hotel room somewhere or uh, you know, on a, on a somewhere else. You can hook your computer up to your television set. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that at your friend's house. That's all included within your subscription. It's another business idea that's enabled by the use of digital rights management. There's the rock band game on the bottom left. Uh, we sell songs that you can play, on, play with, your, uh, with your, your, your musical instruments. Uh, and those songs are, are limited to the particular box. That enables us to sell them at $1.99, uh, despite the effort that goes into creating them. And that's a, that's a new business model. We're available on things like Hulu and Zune, as we talked about. And that, uh, that really takes me to the end of the presentation part of this and really kicks things open for some of the kinds of questions that there are in copyright. Um, and I threw these up there, but I'm really happy to talk about whatever else people are interested in talking about.